Knowledge is power. And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host Michael McCollum and Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1-866-820. 055528. That's 1 866 820 KLAV. Now, let's bring on the hosts. Here is Michael McCollum and Jen Solis. Hi, guys. This is Jennifer Solis. I'm uh, here in studio with a bunch of guests, but not Michael McCullough. Before we talk about why Michael McCullough is not here, I'd like to introduce my guest, Mark Terbeek. He's a lawyer from California and he's a medical marijuana expert. Uh, and he also uh, helps people open dispensaries. We have to my right, Paul Cody. He's a medical marijuana expert. And he's had several businesses in Southern California, uh, cannabis-based businesses. And he is an activist. We have Kurt Dukach, and Dirk, Kurt Dukach works for We Can, and he does our, me, our media, our social media. We have Keith Patton down on the end, and Keith Patton's our special guest uh, in studio today. We're going to talk about Keith's case uh, and what's going on with <laughs> Keith. First of all, I'd like to say that it's a really sad day. Um, Michael McAuliffe has tendered his resignation from We Can as our uh, political media consultant. As of immediately, as of his court date today, he has been efficiently gagged by the federal government, and we're going to talk about that today as far as we can without getting him in trouble. So if Metro, you're out there, thank you for listening all this time, um, but he's not here. Um, let's go on, Mark, and, and let's talk about what happened today in court uh, for Michael McAuliffe. Thank you for having me back again, uh, Jen. I was here a couple of weeks ago to yes, talk about uh, some issues concerning the uh, cannabis movement. Uh, and here uh, today I'm to talk about uh, what happened today in federal court. Um, now today uh, Mr. McAuliffe uh, was subjected to a federal court hearing concerning the uh, attempt to revoke his supervised release status uh, and return him to federal prison for up to 15 months. Uh, I was part of the legal team uh, that helped uh, defend against that. and. Uh, the long and the short of it is at the end of the day. Uh, he's the, not in jail. The, he's not in jail, and the court, uh, as a quid pro quo for not putting him in jail, uh, required that uh, the term of the supervised release be modified to prevent him from engaging in uh, any advocacy work whatsoever to require his resignation from WECAN and to otherwise uh, cease what the court considered, quote, consulting, unquote, as to any matter related to uh, any marijuana program or the marijuana industry. And I just want to give a shout out to, to Gary Modafferi, who was uh, lead counsel in the matter uh, and who uh, took an opening uh, provided by my offer of expert testimony on what constitutes uh, a medical cannabis consultant versus an advocate. To, That's a good question. Yes, to uh, to arrive at a situation because within 90 seconds of the hearing, uh, it was pretty apparent that the court uh, really wanted to put him in jail. Um, you know, Paul, you were in you were in court today. Did it did it appear that the judge was really um, about to put him in jail and? Uh, yes, there is a frustrated uh, look on the judge when he came into the courtroom right away. He uh, looks per pe perplexed. Uh, I know Michael has been leading out, out here in the medical marijuana community um, by advocacy, advocacy and speaking on behalf of many patients that have not had voices. So I, when I was trying to understand the grounds of his consulting versus his advocacy and activism, I, it was a gray area that I wish the court would have took more time with. The Nevada community is losing an incredible activist and a wonderful person that really cares about the people. I feel the same. I, I, I think I had to pull over for about 15 minutes on the side of the road after I heard after I heard what had gone on because it made me physically ill to my stomach. 
Um, and and this wouldn't be taking place if it you know if it had been some other type of charge. But th- they're saying that the difference is it, it doesn't matter if he got paid for it that we're not that he is consulting and and so to my mind then i'm consulting you know because i'm an advocate i've been an advocate so so what would the difference be mark well i i tried to uh well through uh, mr motiferi uh, i did offer a an argument and a, a potential testimony on that topic um, the difference between an advocate and a consultant is that a, a consultant has a relationship with a, an identified person, client, or enterprise for a defined scope uh, toward a defined end uh, for uh, a compensation that is either set or waived. Uh, it's a, basically a commercial activity as opposed to classic free speech. That is what a consultant is. I was a consultant to, in the court today uh, for Mr. McAuliffe through his attorney offering expert testimony as to what constitutes a medical cannabis consultant. So Mark, Mark why, would, why would him being on the radio program uh, consist of consulting and not just advocacy? It's not like mm-hmm. somebody can actually call him and say, well, Michael, I want you to help me um, to open this dispensary while we're on the air here or anything else. We're just talking about news that's straight off straight off the Internet or, or our, our sources, that, you know, within Clark County, which we have a lot of. This is news and journalism, to my mind. The court drew the inference that any advocacy that Mr. McAuliffe may have been engaged in necessarily involved consulting in furtherance of that advocacy. I disagreed with that inference and uh, tried to get some testimony in to rebut that inference. Uh, The court did not want to even hear about my qualifications, was uninterested in doing something, uh, it's a legal procedure called vordering me, that is asking me about the basis for my qualifications and assumed that the formation of this consulting arrangement was an issue of law when in fact the existence of a contract for consulting or anything is a fact question. Uh, So the the court made uh, all of these inferences and determinations, but the bottom line was is that the government wanted to silence Mr. McAuliffe, silence his advocacy, and the court was persuaded by that approach and at the end of the day uh, put Mr. McAuliffe in a position where his attorney had to effectively offer that silence uh, in exchange for his freedom. And that is really a a sad and disturbing approach. That is a sad and disturbing approach. I thought about doing the radio show with a piece of tape on my mouth, but it wouldn't have the same impact, really. Almost, Jennifer, when when a man like Mike, his freedom is being stripped like that, every day we need to go ahead and bring that kind of awareness we have to speak out every day get a hold of the people in these communities like we can and explain how our rights are being stripped from us every single day when gentlemen like mike are being thrown to the side because his expertise is needed right now in the medical marijuana community the first the first time that uh his house was raided and he and he was uh violated on parole i think it was like in uh, uh july july what happened preceding that was that he went on um, the John Ralston show with Dana Gentry and he spoke out against Metro and their heavy handed tactics uh, for medical marijuana patients and that they were destroying people's houses and and hurting people in the attempt to get no charges and charges were dropped. And his, his points were that all of this money on these Metro raids are being wasted and it's to no avail because nothing's being turned up. Two days later, his sister's house was raided, and they found a medical they found a, a medical vial from a, a, a regular doctor of pills that had been expired four years ago in some kind of box from stuff that was stored in a garage. And they went over to his house and they destroyed his house. And do you know what they found? Nothing. Not one seed. Not one paper. Not one plant. Not a joint, nothing, 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 nothing that they find at his house. And they destroyed his rolled in shutters. They bombed his house and kicked his cat 
and found nothing. And then they violated his parole because they said that he had been over his sister's house and that pill vial proved it. So now they're just trying to screw with him again. Oh, can I say that? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, well, I don't think it's a coincidence that the enforcement actions concerning Mr. McAuliffe's supervised release have occurred directly on the heels of advocacy he has taken on behalf uh, of the issue of cannabis normalization. Uh, it's not that he has particularly been a consultant for any person or group. It is that he has been an advocate on an issue. And because he has been such an effective advocate, uh, he has gotten noticed. Mm -hmm. And in situations like this, particularly uh, given his status uh, his as being convicted of an offense, trumped up as it might have been in the first place, uh, because of that status, he's a target, yeah. and yeah. That, that's yeah. what they, that's what the government did, and so effectively, it comes down to this: is he's going to, he would be silenced if he was put in prison anyway. That's the truth. And uh, by offering and agreeing to remain silent on this issue, he maintains his freedom, uh, and it's a despicable trade-off in a free society, yep. but. It's a trade-off that uh, I have to, you know, as from a legal standpoint, say I respect him making yeah. uh, under the circumstances because he was not going to be able to be much of an advocate, even if he ultimately prevailed in an appeal on a writ of habeas corpus, uh, because it would take months at least for that to occur. So the bottom line on this one is the enforcement actions all occurred following his advocacy because he's an effective advocate on an issue that the federal government has historically opposed. That, that's true. The the every time that he is that he's been um, that they've gone after him and they have raided him. It's, it's followed on the heels of a media involvement in in which his in the which his level um, of visibility has been significantly raised. Um, we're doing great things with We Can. We're doing great things with the community. I'm feeling great, you know, really good about it. And every time that this this happens, where we build up to this point, then and then this kind of knocks it down a little bit. I mean, but you need to understand, and everybody needs to understand, they're advocates. And if you cut off one head, then there's going to be like five to take their place. And you know what? And uh, you know what? And that's that's what's going to happen because people are mad. We might be stoners, we might be potheads or whatever else, but you know what else? I'm sick of being my rights being violated just because somebody sees me as a slacker or a stoner or anything else. I medicate to help my pain. I don't take Xanax. I don't, don't take Oxycontin. I don't take many of the drugs other people do to make them happy or, or pain-free. And I'd like respect for my personal choices and not, and not that to be stepped upon. If I may add, uh, the good news on the movement end of it is that things are changing rapidly and dramatically in favor of cannabis normalization. That's true. Yes. We None of us could have imagined five years ago that we would be here today, and five years from today, we will be amazed at, I hope, uh, at the progress that we've made. Yeah, Maine, oh, just, yes. Maine just got uh, medical cannabis uh, legalization, didn't they? 21st state? 21st state just Maine. came came forward with it. Way to go, Maine. Woohoo! Uh, Woo and there are estimates board. that within the next... Maryland. Maryland, okay. Oh. And there are estimates that within the next uh, three to five years... Thanks to our will producer. Be, <laughs> there will be at least five other states that uh, have uh, legalization or normalization laws. Isn't there also a story about Eric Holder is coming out saying that um, total legalization in, in, in Colorado and Washington uh, is a good thing? The Associated Re Press reported on that. Uh, Eric Holder's statements basically were that he was encouraged by the progress that those states have made in their statewide regulation of cannabis. Ooh, gay. Revisiting something that occurred last year, which uh, was doubtless expressed on this program, was the Cole Memo, in which the Department of Justice laid out parameters by which it would, by which it would inform prosecu prosecutorial discretion to not move against cannabis facilities that were in operating, compliance? operating and in compliance with a robust statewide regulatory system that featured a 
fee tax assessment component to support an enforcement component administered through a constitutional agency. Uh, so Washington and Colorado have recreational, I call it uh, general adult use statutes concerning that aspect of it. Nevada now has a medical statute concerning the medical use of cannabis. Uh, all of those are robust, comprehensive, statewide reg regulation systems that involve tax fee and spend uh, or tax fee and assessment components that used, are used to enforce the compliance with uh, the regulations. And that's what the federal government as a policy is looking for. So if you're if you're being good, you're following your regulations that that are very stringent and robust and and strict on what you should be doing, then they're not going to come forward and raid you and prosecute you and and all that nasty stuff. Is that the long and the short of it? It's actually a little more subtle than that. Um, what the what it means is that the prosecutors in your area, their discretion as informed from the top is to back off of that. And so there is some additional leeway there. Uh, the real work is in the advocacy work to make sure the states that have this type of robust system push back against any federal enforcement actions that are attempted against their legitimate compliant participants and use the, the resources and the sovereign power of the state to push back against that, which I think the federal government is cognizant of Mm -hmm. and wants to avoid. They want to avoid that challenge. So I should join the militia? <laughs> join an advocacy group like oh, okay. we can. Okay, okay. Join an advocacy group like we can. We're not quite the militia, but you know what? We do come into uh, town hall meetings. We do go We do go to our uh, city hall meetings, and we do to speak out against things that are trying to be done to people. Um, we're going to be going into a break here soon, and when we get back from the break, we're going to talk to uh, a patient that has, has had his rights violated and kind of taken away maybe. Um, I, I don't know what I can say. I'll talk to him on the break about not getting him in trouble. Oh, okay, but when we get back from the break, we'll talk to him. Cannabis has been used as a healing medicine for over 5,000 years with no toxic side effects. Is it right for you? The professionals at Dr. Reefer are here to help. Now accepting new patients, make an appointment today at 428-0000. Bring your medical records, or if you don't have them, their staff will work to document your qualifying condition with a 99% approval rate. If you have any of the following conditions, cancer, AIDS, muscle spasm diseases, severe nausea, severe pain, Crohn's disease, glaucoma, or PTSD, call Dr. Reefer today for your free consultation and their money-back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Call 702-428-0000 to get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Hi, our 420 moment today is about Michael McAuliffe. I met Michael McAuliffe over eight years ago, and we were both in the uh, the advocacy gig, and we really just bonded as friends. Um, I know his family. He's a great person. He's advocated, and he's given away meds for free. I've seen it personally with my own eyes. Uh, he's advocated in the community, and he's been our strongest support and media supporter. So this 420 moment is for Michael McAuliffe. So, Michael, we salute you. Yeah. I'd also like to point out that those commercials are pre-recorded to Metro. So, if you're listening, Metro, he's not in the studio. 
<laughs> All right. So we've come back from a break now, and we have Keith Patton. Keith, can you talk about a little bit about what's been happening to you um, with the court system? Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. The long and the short of it, I guess, is that I moved from Virginia to be closer to my son. And from that time, immediately uh, going into court, the medical marijuana status was used against me. I had zero arrests, zero crimes, zero any, anything at all. And that simple fact that I have THC in my system has had the courts pretty much deem me as unfit. And they've put me through everything from drug rehab to supervised visits at the home to supervised visits at the courthouse, uh, wow. you name it. I've jumped through every hoop possible. And if, if I had stayed in Virginia, I would have had my son one month at a time every four months completely unsupervised, just me and him doing whatever I wanted. <laughs> Wow. But to move closer to be part of his life. So you, so you move to Las Vegas and you have zero convictions, zero arrests, zero involvement with uh, the judicial system as far as medical cannabis other than, uh, the, other than family court? Right, exactly. Or cannabis in general. I have zero. Um, my only thing on my record is that I have a driving while uh, talking on my cell phone. I was on speakerphone waving the phone around like an idiot. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, I, was, I, yeah. I mean, at least I was smart enough to have it on speakerphone. It wasn't to my ear, but, you know, I got caught. It is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is, but it isn't a medical cannabis conviction. Exactly. And that's the point. That's and the exactly police didn't assume I was under the influence. So you, are you saying that the court actually kind of assumed that you were under the influence immediately when you walked in? or No, not when I immediately walked in because they, they didn't have any indication of that their marijuana was even a topic. And because it wasn't introduced in the initial uh, pleadings. Okay. Once we got into court and we were actually sitting in court, that's when it initially got dropped. And it wasn't supposed to be carried over, but the judge heard it. So they forced me to drug test and then use the drug test results against me. Well, were you a card carrying or a card holding member or a card holder, a medical cannabis card holder of in Nevada? I had had the doctor's recommendation, and to my understanding, that that was valid for be, for using the medicine. Um, and but I didn't present it to the courts because there's nothing, as far as I understand, in custody court that makes you present any of your medical illnesses or, you know, I thought that that was some sort of a patient doctor confidentiality. So there was no reason for me to present I'm a medical marijuana patient because it was never brought to the attention, you know. So when they made these accusations uh, against you and you and you volunteered that you were a medical cannabis patient. I wasn't patient. able to volunteer. They didn't give me the opportunity to speak whatsoever. You spoke through a lawyer or a uh, lawyer spoke for you? But the lawyer wasn't able. To, I, I, I left the courtroom knowing that I had to go take a drug test uh -huh. and at that point was informing my lawyer that there's no way I'm going to pass this and, and I have a car like I'm a medical patient like there but I'm going to have THC in my urine like let me ask you this did your lawyer uh offer to make medical uh your medical use an issue uh, an issue of fact or consideration for the court did he even suggest that what, what I don't understand well, you mentioned that the, uh, the that the court wasn't aware that your use of cannabis was a medicinal use, or that I was even using cannabis at all, or that you were even using cannabis at all. Uh, did you have any input from your lawyer on that? Did he suggest not to bring it up? Did he suggest to bring it up? Did he mention it to you at all? I didn't mention it to them because they had no indication that I was a patient. Why would I? Why would I volunteer, volunteer that information? That, yeah. It's you know, it's my own doc, my own patient confidentiality. Like Jen was saying earlier, the last thing I do is, oh, you're just some stoner dad. You know, then that's the initial response. And so why would I tell these people if I had, I'm not required to? I gave them all my financial information. I gave them all the required information that they asked of me. But how about with respect to did you, you and your lawyer, not the court, but you and your lawyer communicate about that issue? No. Did he ask you about it after you informed him that you were going to fail the, the test? They just asked me if there was another medication I could take. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's what it became. Then at that point, I went through drug rehab. Mm -hmm. And was told that I'm lucky marijuana hasn't killed me. Really? Yeah, oh. through the drug rehabs that are that are put through the court system here. Misinformation. Well, it is horrible. Inform it is inform misinformation, and also uh, we've we've come across several people that are, have this exact uh, exact um, case that they tell them that they need to quit the cannabis or they need to take these rehabilitation. Um, classes, and then they use those statistical numbers to say that people are addicted to cannabis. Right. It's like a vicious circle with the, the, the federal government and, and the, the 
court system because then they're saying that these people are addicted to cannabis, that there's X number of people in Las in Vegas rehab. that sought treatment. Right. How many of those people sought treatment if they weren't court ordered? Not many. Seriously. And, have you ever sought treatment for your cannabis use? Well, I was sat the, in there with drug users. You know, I've... And, and this is, you know, kudos to the uh, to the family courts. I moved here and I didn't know, you know, you guys were the first people that I met or that were in the, the cannabis I- industry at all. And they told me that I was ingrained in the culture. And you guys, that was <laughs> that was two years ago that I or a year and a half ago or something that I first sort Knew of met you guys, you guys yeah. and, and you guys you know it's been a year and a half and how well do you know me you know what I mean like how ingrained am I in your everyday culture uh, you know, not at all exactly. I, I saw <laughs> I saw your story I saw your story on Facebook we were Facebook friends right. because of meeting each other right. a couple years ago and I saw your story and I said you know what this is insane mm-hmm. and then so I, I kind of communicated then to you about it saying you know look, could you please tell me some more about this because we have this radio show and and then you were like very forthcoming and, and very forthcoming right about what your story was yeah. and, but other than us hanging and chilling together <laughs> I, I, I Keith know. and I don't Keith, <laughs> Keith and I don't do that I mean like, no so he's not ingrained he's not really ingrained in the culture um, you know as far as hanging with everybody and this being some kind of syndicate or something well the know. drug test results the ATI and stuff they even say that my use is minimal if you look at the in the, the statistics nanograms? yeah it was 12 nanograms below 25 you know for most drug testing is 25 and 50 so i can actually pass a drug test to drive a, a bus for the city or pretty much any job in the city that tests for marijuana i can get right now wow but i can't take care of my son that's my that's my he- my heavy cannabis use that's so the takeaway i think from this is is for uh you and and people in your position is to talk to your lawyer about your medical use of cannabis or anything um, or anything. Yes, exactly. could be but brought against you. Obviously. But particularly if it's if it's with respect to, to cannabis, you know the, the courts aren't going to blink an eye if you have a condition that requires you to take uh, Vicodin uh, right. a couple of times a week, uh, as long as you're able to otherwise properly supervise and care for your child. The cannabis is the one with uh, a stigma to it, right. and and it's imperative that people faced with this fight that stigma and and get a lawyer who either uh, knows about these issues, particularly with respect to cannabis, or is willing to become informed with them. Because in Nevada in particular, and Nevada is one of the unique states on this one, your right to consume it for medical reasons is a state constitutional, constitional right. That's hence, right. We hence, use that in court, too. And I also have a constitutional right to parent my child as I see fit unless deemed unfit. But the, but the concept is <laughs> that you want to take away from here is so get that information to your lawyer early and have your lawyer vigorously advocate that in family law cases so that the court can be informed. Because um, if you could, uh, would mind telling the audience, uh, what was your uh, uh, the condition that required you to use medical cannabis or the, which, for which you found medical cannabis helped? Well, in 2003, I had four skull fractures. I slipped on some stairs, and I had four skull fr- fractures of the skull. Or I guess skull fractures of the skull or of the mm-hmm. skull, huh? Um, <laughs> and I cut the temporal artery on the right side of my head. Uh, the artery, they weren't sure where the artery cut, and luckily I had a fracture also in my ear canal, so that allowed for the blood to bleed out to keep the brain from swelling. Yeah. But they actually had to cut me fully open on the side of my head um, pull the muscle and tissue aside to find where the artery was cut, repair that. When I woke up, I had both arms, st- you know, in ne- with needles, my legs in the machines, my head, I had a drainage tube. Um, I mean, you name it, I was hooked up to every machine. I wasn't supposed to walk and talk and live. So here's how uh, other people in your position can deal with this. Help it- me and back me up right now, because if we, if we change this now, if we set this precedence now, and so, we show them that these parents, we're not, sorry for the use of words, but we're not retarded. Like, we are very capable, smart human beings, and we love our children, and we can take care of them just as well, if not better than other folks. Then that's what needs to happen. Do you need, do you need court support? Because you know I'll put it up on our Facebook. And, and just, I don't know when the next court date is, but just, just whenever general. It is, whenever it is, you let us know, and I'll put it up there. Okay. As, as soon as possible, let us know so that we can create an event for it. Well, and they get closed the last board. hearing. They closed the last hearing. There was media that, that re- requested, and it was granted by higher-ups, and then they actually kicked the media out. 
and then they sealed the case for 10 days. So I can't actually even talk about what happened during the last court date. What I can say is that it's starting to go more in my direction and they're starting to recognize oh, that I'm a goodness. patient. Um, but it's been, you know, my son is, I was telling you outside, my son is now covers his ears and closes his eyes to keep the outside out. I can't imagine how heartbreaking that is for you. You know, especially it's when you, you're not able to see your son for, you know, lengths of time. And then when you do see him, it, it it's under conditions that are less than ideal. You yeah. know, this is freaking heartbreaking. And, you know, CPS and the family court system, I know there are good judges out there. But these people that are running rough, roughshod over people's rights just on, on personal bias need to go. Yeah. The, the takeaway on this one, I think, is is this, is that you want to talk to your attorney in custody situations like this if you're a medical cannabis patient and you want to let that attorney know and get that attorney's buy-in to vigorously advocate your medical constitutional Mm -hmm. right to use cannabis under the Nevada Constitution and that it is a safer, less toxic alternative than, say, the Neurontin or the Oxycodone or the Percocet or the other things that uh, will uh, impair your uh, judgment and mental functioning much more severely and tax your liver. Mm-hmm. Not only that, they can get you, uh, some of the Oxycontin uh, can get you addicted to heroin. Oh, yeah. 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 And that from a medical yeah. standpoint, you Gateway are capable <laughs> of discharging all of your parental functions and make the medical yeah. argument hard and early and often in the context of whatever medical condition. In your case, you had a pretty significant medical if condition. You, yes. If you have if you have pictures of you in the hospital with I the have Jesus. my skull fracture like I have a picture afterwards with all the stitches and it's almost famous like because they because it looks like a big question mark. Oh, it's wow. on Instagram, all my friends have it like you well, know. I mean, if you, the, you know, we, we just got kind of in this argument with somebody, not really an argument, but it, it, it was more like somebody, somebody said to me that the, I didn't look sick, that <laughs> I was able to work and therefore I'm uh. not a patient. And I, I was like, you know what, how dare you judge me from what I look like? Because, you know, you can't see cancer. Right. You can't see, you know, you can't see pains, aches, pains, whatever. You can't see that, that type of thing. And looking at you, you look like a really... A healthy young man. Yeah. You look like you look like you're on top of the world, except you know for the sadness. But, but because of that, because of the fact that I use a natural medicine, is why I'm on top of the world. Yep. Is why I'm able to. I go out and I rollerblade, and I, you know I do these things outside at the parks, and I jump on handrails, and I slide down and fall, and you can see I got cuts on my elbows, and I bounce right off the concrete like I'm 14 years old. You know, yeah. and months ago when I was taking the taking the regular medicine and I was going through the drug rehab I was sleeping all day I was vomiting every day you know I I lost I mean I lost 20 pounds and I'm 135 40 pounds you know what I mean I lose 20 pounds I'm I'm hurt yeah and and it happens but using cannabis on a regular basis in a minimal smart strategic amount it keeps me eating healthy it keeps me sleeping properly it keeps my muscles relaxed it keeps me with zero pain and i'm able to live a more than functional life you yeah. know above yeah. what i would ever be able to live on any yeah. of these pills and, and, and cannabis. you know yeah, 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 yeah. We're yeah, afraid exactly. of it because it makes you I'm feel good and happy. I'm so lazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> scared of that euphoric Yeah, value. such an awful side effect. Yeah, can you jump on this countertop? Because <laughs> <laughs> I can jump on it laying backwards. <laughs> you know, and, and that's just the thing. If it keeps you happy and it keeps you healthy, then why not? Right. Because, you know, Xanax, nobody nobody question me right now if I was taking <laughs> Xanax because with all all of the stuff that I've heard this week, you know what? I could use a couple. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, the thing is, I, I, I could, but the thing is, I use, you know, biofeedback. I, go, I went and sat next to a fountain. I smoked before I got here. I got, I got here a couple hours early because I was upset, and I thought, okay, well, I need to, do, you know, do this. And th- that's how you cope with it. You get to areas early. You do what you need to do, and you medicate, um, you know, according to your symptoms or your need. Mm-hmm. Really? The and responsibly. Because that's, a, I think, a big thing that we need to push to, and that's huge, is responsible cannabis use. Because the whole fact is, is you can use cigarettes responsibly. You can use alcohol responsibly. You, there's all these things that you can do to hurt yourself responsibly that are illegal. Why can't I use something that, even if you think cannabis hurts me, why can't I use it responsibly? Exactly. Exactly. 
And I'd like to point out another thing is you, you might be taking it for pain, but like for me myself, I take it for pain. But when it comes to stress, it's the best thing there is for stress. You know, you just learn mm-hmm. that, hey, you know what? This thing works. This plant works for much more than what I originally started using it for. And there's nothing wrong with it. There, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. You know, feeling good and being happy and, you know, living a pain free life or, you know, it doesn't have to cure cancer to be medicine. Yeah, it's a quality of life issue. I mean, I think a lot of people have spoken to me about the quality of life issue, that the quality of life that they have on cannabis is significantly better than what the pills version is that the doctor's trying to push toward mm-hmm. them. Absolutely. They, they, your quality of life is better on cannabis because you can function, and it just kind of takes the pain and, and, and it puts it away from you. It doesn't, it doesn't completely take my pain away, but it doesn't make me focus on the pain. You know? it, it pretty much takes my pain away simply because most of my pain is from muscle tension. Ah. And because of the lack of tension, then that minimizes where once I get the tension, it forms in the skull and in everything. You know, w- tension causes tension. So as soon as it starts to get tight, <laughs> it gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter until it gets to the point where my whole from the lower back to my frontal lobe is tight and I eventually vomit. Maybe yeah. it re- releases the pressure. Maybe it doesn't. So yeah. Stress makes you stress. Yeah, right? <laughs> Vicious cycle. For people facing your issue, you, you just want to, and I'm going to come back to this, you want to make sure that you uh, present the case, the medical case, to the court uh, and inform your attorney and get the proper resources to make that case, the, the doctors, uh, the attorney, so that the court can have the information. Because if the court... Preempt them. If the court yeah. only has information that you have... Uh, uh, prohibited substance in your bloodstream and you're giving them no alternative basis for ruling, they're going to rule uh, that you're taking a Schedule One substance and ding you for it. Yep. Uh, and you have to give them, you have to make it a problem for them. And that's, that's how you avoid uh, the disastrous results in court uh, for, you know, like what happened with Mike today. We, we put evidence before the judge or an argument before the judge where the judge was going to have a problem doing what we think he wanted to do, which is throw Mike in jail. But we made the argument. We made the offer of proof. We had the resources to do it, uh, and it's just what you have to do to avoid situations like this. And it's not always going to be avoided, but at least it gives you a chance. chance. Okay. So, again, the takeaway, be prepared. Don't be afraid to tell your lawyer about what you need, and if the lawyer that you have doesn't understand medical cannabis, get, a new get one, one that does. Yes, that's my. That, I want to real quick on that. I had two lawyers, and I, I mean, I'm almost at the point where I'm over talking lawyers? about them. No, well, lawyers in general, but talking about them. Sorry, Mark. Um, uh, the last one I had is the only one who's standing up for my rights. My rights, not simply, oh, well, can't you just use something else? You know? Yeah. I, if they I, say that. Find another lawyer because yep. I really am telling you. Exactly. If you, if you can't you just you do something else because you're not a qualified you, lawyer? You got to get a lawyer. <laughs> you got to get a lawyer that understands medical cannabis because if they don't, they're going to uh, feed you mm-hmm. into the jaws of the beast. Yep, and he's he's right. I'm I'm in the jaws of the beast. It hurts. I was going to say so. The best, the the best, uh, the best defense is a good offense. You go in there and you tell on yourself. You yep. go, guess what? I'm a great parent, and this is why I can stay awake and deal with my child. And I'm and I'm more likely to sit there and play with blocks on the floor than fall asleep during the oxycontin, you know, haze. Indeedly doodly. <laughs> Indeedly doodly. Okay, we're going to go on a break, and when we come back, we're going to ha- uh, talk at more at length uh, to Paul Cody. And we're going to talk about our rights being taken away and how we can fight that activism. Did you know that over 100,000 people in America are dying on an annual basis due to prescription medications? Yet marijuana has been around for 10,000 years and used as a medical resource and has never been known to kill a human being ever. But yet, we're not utilizing this great medication. Here at Karma's Holistic Health Foundation, it is our sole purpose to get you to your medicine as quickly as possible, all while following the state of Nevada's laws. Please call us today and we will get you your medical marijuana card at 702-388-1119, 702-388-1119, or visit us online at getmedicalmarijuanaNow.com. Thank you. 
Weekend 702 is a Nevada cannabis community. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that meets in Southern Nevada. We are a social group that started in Las Vegas for patient support. We've been active in the community for over five years. If you'd like to join us on any of our events or parties, please contact us through Facebook at Weekend 702 on Meetup at www.meetup.com forward slash WeCan702. Our website is www.wecan702.org. Be a part of the Nevada Cannabis Reform Revolution. Please join us and donate today. Hi, everybody. We're back from break, and we have Keith Patton, Kurt Dukoch, Paul Cody, and Mark Derbeek. Um, you know, when we went on the break, we were having a heated discussion about family court and our, tr- and our rights being trampled on and what we can do to kind of push back. You know, um, so let's talk about somebody who classically likes to push buttons. Paul? <laughs> you have a we, button to push? <laughs> I might. <laughs> but uh, you're, you're quite the vocal advocate, and you, uh, you were quite the vocal advocate in Southern uh, California. And uh, can, can you speak to some of the issues that, that, uh, that, has ha- that have happened to you and, that you've, and you, how you've pushed back? Yeah, thank you, Jen. In San Diego, I founded a, a large medical marijuana collective, filed nonprofit, I believe ran well, correct, correctively within the laws. And I, ex- ex- I exhibited, or actually I felt firsthand, the target on my back uh, by the local uh, police, by local misinformed uh, parent groups, by general uh, people that wished uh, to have me uh, ostracized from the community rather than have me be part of the community. Uh, I actually uh, had a chance to come to, to Las Vegas and further my a- activism work through medical cannabis it's been over 20 years trying to get the information to people that actually can do something with this information. Uh, just lately, out here, because of you, you Jennifer, uh, ex- <laughs> experiencing you, the uh, help from WeCan, uh, it's been a phenomenal jump. Um, the bipartisan work between the politicians, it's been a great group effort, a great state effort, and the community is going to benefit large by the acceptance of cannabis as medicine. You can work with it in the neighborhoods, in the groups, helping people, getting in control of their lives, feeling that they can maintain their lives, and actually the community knowing that this is a viable tax source and it can be tolerated at all levels. That's great. That's great. Can you uh, tell me about, you You said that you had some community programs where you actually felt that you helped the community uh, be safer. Um, uh, could you tell me and expand on those community programs that you that you mm-hmm. kind of were telling me about earlier? Yeah, well, the transparency we all want to see in the medical cannabis industry is taxation, representation, and a community that will benefit. Not just the profit margins for the business owners, but the patients all across the line. We're talking low income. I myself in a wheelchair now for more than 20 years. Uh, it's been very, very tough. I have experienced access for my medicine, um, court system, standing in my way, get safe access. I came upon a large need for giving medical cannabis to patients that had no help, no money, no resources. I founded the Medical ho- medical Cannabis Hospice Program, which you can get a link of at MarijuanaHut.com. I get out there quite a bit and get in, this, get in the low, low areas and try to get them medicine firsthand. And then the only way we can do this is through the efforts of a lot of groups coming across and shaking hands and allowing people like Jennifer, the larger scope of activists in this group, like Michael, should be presented in a viable area and given a chance to speak firsthand knowledge. Not people that are representing things that they might have read, things that they heard, but actually the people that do it firsthand. You know that's and that's a really good point. You we I mean, to be a community activist, you actually have to get out there and every shake day, hands man. every day, and you have to know people's personal stories, and you know, and maybe you know go, have gone to the hospitals, stuff like that. That's not stuff that we just we like to like spout and talk that, about that we do. But you know what? The reason that I know everybody in the community is not because I'm on the radio, or it's not because I have Facebook fans. It's because I go out there and I go hiking and I go to other community events that have nothing to do with cannabis and I talk about cannabis in a very frank and open uh, method where they can see wow she's normal 
she smart well i hope that they think i'm smart but um you know that so that people out there in the community can see that i'm accessible i'm a normal human being i'm just a cannabis patient but i don't just hang with my cannabis folks i go out there with the hiking folks i go out there with the burning man folks i go out there and i talk to different groups um lawyers, like the non politicians. lawyers politicians non-profit other non-profits uh and, and it's through those efforts and getting out there and being visible in the community that you, that you show people that this is a viable community, we're nice, approachable people, and also we get things done. I'm not a slacker. Mm -hmm. I think there's a parallel to be drawn there between cannabis normalization on that regard and, uh, and marriage equality. As more and more people see that people who use cannabis medicinally and otherwise are normal, successful, actual people, uh, just as they find that people who uh, are gay are normal, successful, actual people, the stigma decreases. And it's uh, important to get, get out there to present, for those who use cannabis, to present themselves as actual, regular people that happen to use cannabis so that the stigma and the stereotypes can be eroded. And that's where the progress really gets made in the community. You know, they, we are productive members of, the, of society, and, and we'd like to see, be seen that way. But, you know, I almost see that this, is, this can be seen as, you know, interracial couples. I mean, in the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, this wasn't a thing that was, that, that was done or, or that was normal. But now people don't think twice when they see interracial couples. I think that that, that is going to go just the same way that um, same-sex couples are now that then it's going to be just a normalized thing. And I want that for the, the cannabis use. I want pot to be the, the, the next gay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a civil rights well, movement. It's as simple as that. And, and fighting for it in that uh, normal, normalized way is also a key aspect of it. Uh, I actually just want to mention what, one thing my brother did. My brother, John Trevick, he moved to Michigan. He began growing. He's a medical cannabis patient, a successful attorney, by the way. Wow, okay. Uh, uh, had uh, come back from a felony conviction uh, for transporting cannabis decades ago was pardoned by Jeb Bush, <laughs> then Bre President Bush's brother, uh, and came back, uh, retired to Michigan, and began growing cannabis. The town that he was in, Wyoming, the town of our birth, our ancestral town, passed an ordinance that says you can't do that. We're going to fine you. He took it to court. He, he lost at the trial court. He appealed. He won on the appellate level. They took it to the Supreme Court. He won at the Supreme Court level. And it's been huge. Now the Michigan legislature is uh, considering legislation uh, to normalize cannabis use for medical purposes awesome. in a much larger, more robust way. And people see this fellow, this lawyer, this accomplished lawyer, this graduate, uh, as a normal person. And that goes a long way toward reducing the stigma and of course his advocacy has now put the city of Wyoming on its heels and they're having to accept the reality of medical cannabis. So Mark, you're from a family of fighters. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, it, it's interesting enough, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, when we were all uh, consumers of cannabis uh, on another level, uh, we never thought we'd get to the position where we are now, but uh, now it turns out uh, the Dubiques are a cannabis family. <laughs> and uh, my brother has uh, fought some good fights in Michigan, won, and uh, I'm out here in California, Nevada, and elsewhere fighting a good fight. And I'd like to say, you know, Mark was instrumental in, uh, in, in bringing a lot of this law to uh, our state legislature. He was up there, and I think that he spoke and was influen influential uh, on a number of levels. Uh, him and um, also Dan Rush. Uh, Dan Rush is uh, the head of the union, the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, and uh, local. we have a local 7-Eleven here in um, Las Vegas, but he is, Dan Rush is the head of uh, the Cannabis Workers Rights that's an offshoot of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union. Um, you know, can you expand a little bit about the union, Mark? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, I started working with uh, the United Food and Commercial Workers, actually at Local 5. To understand about unions like the United Food and Commercial Workers, there's the umbrella organization, the international union, and then 
uh, every uh, jurisdiction, local jurisdiction, has its local union. Here in Nevada, it's local 7-Eleven. In uh, California, Northern California, it's local 5. So Dan and I worked with Local 5 to advocate for a transparent merit-based process before the City of Oakland, uh, and that was one of the first, if not the first, such uh, ordinance and application process in the nation. That's been taken to other states and localities. And we worked through the union uh, with regard to that. And the union, the United Food and Commercial Workers, both locally and nationally, has been an effective advocate uh, for cannabis normalization uh, and I give my hats off uh, to the United Food and Commercial Workers for doing that because they've had some reach out uh, to the national political stage and various states' political stages in normalizing the medical use of cannabis and helping basically bring into legitimacy a, a, an industry that has tens if not hundreds of thousands of hardworking members who deserve uh, protection of the law. That's awesome. And it is the third largest union in America. So you know what? When other other venues or other medical cannabis groups have not been able to do a lot in Washington, I do trust the union to get crap done. Um, but you know, on another on another note, um, I'd like to, um, it's not just tax day today. Um, this is the anniversary of uh, Jack Herrera's death. And um, I would like Paul Cody to uh, ha speak a few words about Jack for us um, so that we can also, you know, um, honor the man that actually is bringing hemp to the forefront in America. Yes, uh, yes it's a, uh, well, Jack, Jack Herrera has been well missed for over four years now. It's uh, something that anybody in the industry for uh, has been in it for a while understand that without Jack's work, uh, we would never be in the position where we are today. Uh, his relentless um, documentation of a lot of the uh, documents put f to try to be actually hidden by our own federal government. Jack was able to uncover, put together in a book, and put it forth with people to understand uh, the greatest selling hemp book put together by this great legend, Jack Herr. Uh, he will be forever missed. If I, if I would like to say a little factoid about Jack, sure. um, a lot of people you know, look at this man as uh, the emperor, um, maybe a uh, been arrested many, many times. I'll, I'll have you actually know Jack's been arrested more than 30 times. And probably a lot of people are thinking, well, of course, he's been arrested for marijuana. Most of those arrests were for gathering votes and registering voters. So, and oh, activism. Wow. Activism. The man was true to the truest extent, and he's going to be beyondly missed because powerhouses like that in this industry are, are sorely, sorely missed. Powerhouses like that in this industry not only are sorely missed, but they're also big targets. And I think that the 30 arrests is just kind of, you know, proven that fact. He wasn't arrested for cannabis. He wasn't arrested for that. He was arrested for his activism. Kind of the same that uh, today, what's happened to Michael. Michael's not been arrested, but he was silenced. And and that's and well, ultimately why Jack was probably arrested is to silence him and to stop him. And I think that we can all take from that is that don't stop. Don't stop. And if you see people getting in trouble, you need to go to their court dates. It, you don't, I don't care if you have a personal beef with them. I don't care if you don't like them on a personal level. We're on the same team. It's a medical cannabis team. We're on the cannabis team, pro-cannabis. That is it. If you've got a personal beef with somebody, take them to the side. Take them to lunch. Have a talk with them. But you know what? Present a united front. And that's the most important thing that we can do for activism is present a united front and stand against this oppression. Power so, concedes nothing without a struggle. It never has and it never will. Those were, words were stated by Frederick Douglass in 1857, and they are as true today as they were then. So never give up the fight. And this is it for the weekend. Uh, so get on the bus. We can do it together. And this is it for the weekend Nevada Cannabis News Show. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen.